Sometimes I really wanna be alone, but that's one state I'm never in. Hello and welcome to One Week, One Year, a podcast where we watch and discuss a year of film history every week, starting from 1895, the dawn of cinema, and this week is 1909. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Ellie. I'm a film projectionist, and joining me as always is... I'm your other host, Glenn Cobell. I'm a filmmaker. And we are both podcasters. Look at that. <laughs> this is like Yay. 15 episodes in. I heard that most podcasts don't last past 10 episodes, and we've we've done it, oh, you know? Oh! Yeah. Wow. So, pat, pat, pat on the back for that, definitely. Technically, we are successful. <laughs> by only the by only the the strictest of technical uh, uh, qualifications yes that's all that's all you need um so if you're watching us you know this but we're a, a film history podcast and we're talking about old old movies old movies that are before copyright ever existed is that that's not true um but they're the copyright is expired and so you can watch along on youtube which you might be doing right now or uh you can uh, hit a playlist that will be in the description and on our YouTube page, and uh, you can watch along with sound when available. Some have sound, some don't. We recommend, uh, if they don't have sound, just Google, you know, find on YouTube some kind of appropriate sound to play in the background, because... Uh, you know, 10 hours ragtime music. That's a good um, one. That's a good you one. You know, uh, spooky classical I searched um, today spooky lo-fi beats, you know, whatever you're yeah. whatever you're feeling in Lo-fi the beats to watch old movies too. <laughs> <laughs> um so, uh how you doing, Glenn? What's up? Um yeah, pretty good. Not a bad week mm-hmm. for the world, all things considered, I think. Oh yes, we're recording this as um the Cheeto in chief. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> That was my my cringy lib voice. Um, uh, when the when the the bad man gone, yeah, and bad man gone, and meh man uh, <laughs> here. <laughs> no, Grandpa's driving the car now, but at least he's got a driver's license. Mm, mm. Is um, a comparison I heard someone else make, and so I'm stealing it. Go for it. Who's gonna stop um, you? No one. That's who. Um. Yeah, I I'm realizing that my my facial hair is starting to make me look like uh, a person from the movies that we're watching, and I don't know if that's conscious or not. Are are you um, like evolving into the turn of the century mindset? I think so. I I I started drinking absinthe. I'm I've grown my facial hair out. Method uh, podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> I guess um I'll talk about what I was doing. What I was doing uh is sitting in bed mostly uh having a headache that lasted almost an entire week and today is the first day where i don't feel awful <laughs> that's wonderful to hear i'm genuinely really glad to hear that you're not feeling awful today Thank feeling you. less awful at yeah the least. no i actually woke up like completely fine today which is great like i was like a, a teeth grittingly horrible headache for I was I was I was stringing from Advil to Advil all all Oof. week, you know, uh, but it's over now. Anyway, enough about headaches. What uh, what's gonna make your head and your ears feel great is Glenn reading the news of the year <laughs> uh, from 1909 because we like to bring a little historical context to what we're watching here. So Glenn, will you take it away? The news of the year 1909. Leo Bakelin patents Bakelite, non-conductive and heat-resistant, a revolution in plastics. W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, and other advocates of racial equality found the NAACP. Bangkok, the Kingdom of Siam. The United Kingdom's influence in the Orient is expanded as a treaty creates the modern border between Thailand and Malaysia. Construction begins on the RMS Titanic. Advances in aviation. Louis Blériot becomes the first man to fly across the English Channel. Japanese Prime Minister Ito Hirabumi is assassinated by Korean independence activist An Jung-gun at the Harbin Railway Station in Manchuria. While the world is experiencing more frequent outbreaks, the virus causing polio itself has been discovered. In a prelude to revolutionary Catalonia, Catalan anarchists, socialists, and anti-imperialists 
organize a general strike against the Spanish upper classes and Catholic Church. The army is brought out and over 100 protesters are dead. The Spanish king replaces the prime minister in retaliation. The Daily Bioscope opens in London, the first newsreel theater. The Paris Film Congress is held to create a European film production and distribution cartel in the model of Edison's motion picture patents company. All right. Thanks, and Glenn. That is what happened in the year of 1909. Everything that happened. That's... Nothing else happened that year. Nothing. It was a slow year. <laughs> um, yeah. Newsreel theater. Did you, did you see about that? It was pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, apparently like it wasn't just newsreels. It was like theaters that, um, specialized in short subjects. Um, but often mm. newsreels, which are a new invention, a pretty new invention. Um, but the other kind of interesting thing that happened, this Paris Film Congress happened in February of 20, not 20, as 1909. Mm. <laughs> um, and the year, in December of 1908, like right before this, was the MPCC, the Motion Picture Patent Company, um, mm. which uh, was... Uh, which it's it's its effects only started being felt in this year, but they lasted until about 1914, and it had like this, it, it was this conglomeration. I mean, it's, it was effectively like this price fixing cartel uh, that was cartel, yeah. film cartels <laughs> by the a cartel by the technical um, yeah. um, economic uh, uh, definition, um, uh, put together by the Edison Company. Uh, that restricted the way that films can be distributed and um, and produced and basically tried to cut all uh, competition out of the market. It was like super, super anti-competitive. And um, that that Edison, what a rascal. He wasn't a good guy, I don't think. (laughs) Um, Yeah, there, there was an Edison lawyer who said they want to preserve the business of present manufacturers and not they don't want to throw the field open to all competitors. Uh, so basically, they, they created a an exclusive license with uh, Kodak, Eastman Kodak, to say that only Kodak film or Kodak film could only be given to the companies in the trust, um, which were Edison Biograph Vitagraph SNA. Selig Polyscope, Lubin Manufacturing, Kalem Company, Star Films Paris, and American Pathé. Um, which are all the ones that we've really heard of, but I mean, there, mm. there are independent people well, knocking uh, around a bit. Uh, Gamon? Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, another, another reason for this is that all the best movies are coming out of Europe, and Edison wanted to uh, keep them out of the market, basically. Mm. Um, which I think had was a big boon to American production in the next couple years. Uh, and also, yeah, really changed probably the movie landscape in the U S considering that theaters that did not conform to the MPCC standards were not given any of their, uh, of the MPCC prints. So it was kind of a risk for theaters to play movies from France that weren't Pathé mm. or, or star films. Um, Oof. so I guess Galman actually wouldn't have had a, a place in the U S after that point. Yikes. So the Paris, the Paris film Congress, they were trying to create a European version of it. Um, and it was like promptly shut down in the, in the Paris, in like the French courts, because it was not legal. And it was like businesses acting very, um, unethically, um, Mm. So that's allowed in America, but not in Europe. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Allowed for, um, I don't know, five, six, seven years. But, yeah. you know, th- as we're going through these news segments, we're seeing so much uh, bad labor stuff happening. <laughs> yeah. A lot of strikes with, like, big companies killing hundreds of people, that kind of thing. Um, I-, I didn't really think about how... I don't know. I guess I guess this was in the air, like all of this really horrible uh, business and labor practices back then. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes. I mean, there's lots of. I do kind of associate that with this time period of like the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. Um, 
kind of like pre-Russian Revolution and like, I guess, post-Industrial Revolution in the United States. But like, yeah, just kind of a an era of a lot of like big companies getting getting enormous and then <laughs> like hiring private armies yeah things like that to like push people around i mean yeah i i appreciate a lot of the learning that we're doing with this news segment because um my my mind was kind of just like industrial revolution triangle shirtwaist factory pinkertons <laughs> And now we have like a 40 hour work week, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's the, (laughs) each one leads directly into the next. Right. (laughs) Um, Um, uh, So the the Paris Film Congress, I just wanted to say this is a completely uh, 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 irrelevant note, but the the companies that were, or it actually is a little interesting because it tells you what companies were big at the time to to be able to be joining this. So they were Pathé. Gaumont, uh, and Eclair from France, uh, Cines and Ambrosio Film of Italy, Mester Film from Germany, Hepworth Pictures, good old Cecil Hepworth from Britain, and uh, Nordisk from Denmark. And then Vitagraph was an American company, but they had a lot of European distribution, and so they tried to join the, Th- the Paris Film Congress as well, and arrange like exclusivity with Kodak for the European market. Hmm. The, the non- relevant factoid is that Eclair, uh, you may not have heard of, but it's still, I, I was like, wait, could it be? Could it be? Because Eclair was relevant to my life as a projectionist. They're not around as a filmmaking company anymore, but they're like a post-production and distribution like assistance company. Oh, wow. And so, initially, uh, uh, when I started working as a projectionist, we would get hard drives in the mail, um, and eventually we got this download server that uh, they there was actually like a literal satellite that had hard drives on it, and it would like send if it was a cloudy day, you couldn't receive the 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 films properly, and so they might. Sorry, have to... no movies today. It's there's clouds. I know. Yeah, seriously. Sometimes we got into some scrapes with that, um, but it would it would uh, send the movies to a dish on our roof. And then we'd, we'd load them onto an FTP server in, in, in our uh, uh, projection booth. If, like, send a guy, go out to the dish. Force, <laughs> yeah. We got to show Force Awakens tonight. Go out to the dish. We got to move it. Yeah, seriously. They had, like, a limited amount of hard drive space on the satellite. And so uh, there yeah. were some movies where they would... Um, uh, they wouldn't be relevant to some theater anymore, but I'd need like this trailer or something. And I go like, do you, do you have this trailer? Can you put it on the satellite? And they're like, no, we can only put, we can only put big stuff on the satellite, you know? Um, but so Eclair was not, was the next thing that I got after that, which was essentially that satellite thing, but for indie films. Um, hmm. And so we got this little box that was that had the the Eclair logo on it. It was the same one from the French film company from the turn of the century, um, and uh, you could go to their website rather than just being a uh, satellite thing, like literally a satellite dish. It just went over FTP on the internet, and we would just download the movies uh, onto our from our Eclair server. And I'd never heard of Eclair until they were people who provided indie films to us mm. and. I'm realizing that they were one of these early French film companies. That's really cool. That's yeah. my that's my little side story. <laughs> yeah, nice little anecdote. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, that, that's that's super cool. I I almost I'm like I was aware of, uh, Gamon and Pathé before starting this, but like I I don't think I realized how early those two companies started. Yeah, I think the first two, right? Uh, I mean, pretty much in terms of like fully formed kind of like filmmaking companies. I guess like there was Edison's company, also. Y- yeah, maybe they were the first two in France. Um, um, I mean the yeah. Lumiere, Lumi, just Lumiere and and company. I don't know what they're. I don't know. I feel like I'm uh, going on what Wikipedia has said about like P- Pathé and Gaumont being some of the first of something, yeah. but yeah. Um, I never heard of Gaumont, they were but among the first, yeah, Gaumont oh, yeah. still releases a lot of French movies. 
Really? Um, yeah, I, I'd I never think, heard of them. I'd definitely seen stuff that they'd released before. Uh, like, I was familiar with the name and the logo. Hmm. I knew Pathé from British Pathé. I didn't... Yeah, I, I yeah, assumed it was French, but I didn't... I, the mm-hmm. British arm's pretty big as well. Um, yeah. I will add one more thing about, about all of this trade stuff, is that one of the other kind of st- stipulations of the MPCC was that they wanted films to be one real long. Um at like 13 to 17 minutes is what it said there at, at, at 16 frames a second. And uh, it, it was mandated that films couldn't be longer than that uh, for the companies that were in the MPCC. And so feature films, which were st- which are going to start becoming more of a thing in the next couple of years, were being done by the Europeans and by independent American distributors or, or filmmakers uh, because of the stipulation of the MPCC, and they were holding on to their guns for a really long time. Uh, and so, like, Biograph and Edison and Vitagraph, like, they didn't make any feature films until 1914, mm-hmm. um, which, yeah, really restricted a lot of their output, which I guess we'll be seeing shaping what we're watching in the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yes. it's, it's super interesting to think about weird like weird mandates like that that are directly influencing the kinds of films that we're seeing yeah the art is Um, being mandated by some trade agreement it's ridiculous um and yeah i think it does kind of help explain sort of like why there is kind of this standardized or sort of feeling of a standardized runtime for most of the movies this year or like the last few years i guess yeah from around this time um and yeah so it's it's interesting that that was like no they can only be they can only be 15 minutes long nothing else um not like those rascals down in australia making their you know hour plus movies <laughs> um yeah i don't know what i get i don't have a lot to say about melies's output this year yeah there aren't, there aren't a lot of them and they're not great <laughs> This is kind of... I feel like we're kind of watching the beginning of the end of Melies right now. I mean, we are. He's he's only got a few years left yeah. making movies. Um, and then it's off to the the World War One and not living, living in a Paris train station. Working in a Paris train station. He didn't yeah. live there. Hugo lived, lived there in the movie Hugo. <laughs> <laughs> but in real life, Melies apparently did... Um... Uh, end up working in that train station all day, every day. I think he was working like 12 or 14 hour days every single day of the week yeah. because he was just completely broke after um, after he was done making movies, which is sad. Um, yeah. I mean, he is like the the best filmmaker up to this point. And so it is, it is sad to see like this kind of slow decline a little bit of like most of these movies, maybe all the good ones got burned. But right. most of them in the last couple of years have been kind of like, I don't know, you, just, you feel like his heart isn't in it anymore. You know, they feel it's kind less of, ambitious. Um, yeah, they feel they feel much kind of smaller uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think both I think in kind of scope and ambition. There are like three or four Melies films that have survived and they're all trick films, basically. Uh, yeah. Which are the ones that we tend to avoid these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, because they're they they tend to rely on the same couple of gags and effects. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not super narrative heavy. They're just sort of like, hey, some some like fun little tricks and yeah, and things. Um, well, and apparently the audience. I've been reading a bit that the audiences of this time were getting a little tired of Melies' shtick as well. Mm. Like they were moving on to new genres. In the same way that I feel like I'm, we're a little tired of trick films. I think uh, the audiences were too, and mm-hmm. and Melies was doing his thing and didn't really stop doing his thing. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Um, you want to say anything about these uh, these movies? I mean, other than just the kind of like the greater impression of them from this year. I mean, the one that I definitely liked the most is one that is mostly lost uh which is the spider and the butterfly 
which hmm. only about two minutes of it are known to survive. Mm-hmm. But what a two minutes those are! <laughs> yeah, it's 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 got a lot of um, got a lot of like transformations, and it's got some nice color in it, certainly. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's hard to even describe because there's not. It's just like like a bunch context. of a bunch yeah. of yeah. There's not really any context for it. There's <laughs> there's a butterfly woman. There's a guy who like shoots a rocket or like a like a rifle at this kind of big pinwheel thingy um and it turns into a spider web with this spider octopus woman with a bunch of like tentacle arms um it's just it's a bunch of zany melies ish kind of fantasy stuff yeah um hand colored it looks really really cool um it's got lots of sparklies um like sparks and pyrotechnics going on um this was one of the films that was uh like rediscovered and shown in the 1920s uh Hmm. when melies was like first rediscovered kind of right um they held a big gala in in uh in paris i believe and showed a bunch of his movies and this was one of them but then since then this film was lost again (laughs) jeez somewhere along the line and so now all we got are these last these like two minutes which were only found i think about 10 years ago yeah yeah i think so um yeah i was i was reading a bit about that that night when uh which is depicted in hugo that night where Mm -hmm. uh melies is rediscovered um by all these uh people in this more established film industry now and he was saying you know after he kind of left the film world behind in a blaze of anger uh, a literal one <laughs> um uh that seeing seeing his his uh contributions being respected uh, and um uh you know and revered like that was he i think he said it was like one of the best nights of his life or like the best night of his uh, life yeah i'm gonna cry <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i mean it is it is good to like i do think the story of Meliès as a person is kind of a, a a a somewhat tragic one, um, but I am glad to know that he he got he got that like he knew that people liked his stuff and that yeah like he was able to at least sort of absorb some of that recognition and that like appreciation of his stuff yeah our our mandatory Meliès uh, check in. Uh, will not be happening next week because he didn't make any movies in 1910. Yeah. Uh, apparently, he wasn't actually in bad financial shape necessarily yet um, in 1910, but he was like, he decided to be focusing on stage stuff at the time. Hmm. Um, uh, and then he came back in 1911 working for Pathé, but we can get to that when we get to it. Indeed. Um, um, and then I just could talk about the sort of the heir to uh Melies's goofy throne <laughs> which is i think segundo de chamon is is definitely sort of yeah uh, the uh what what's not predecessor what's the opposite of that uh post decessor <laughs> sure the post decessor to Melies. um he got he had some interesting stuff this year i, l- I liked a lot of his stuff this year yeah um uh, Segundo de Chimon, I I love him. I think he gets like way too slept on, and I would love yeah. to see like a big release of of his movies. Um, like seeing his stuff in in HD would be amazing. Ugh. I think it's like I I don't know if it exists. Like if it's ever been digitally scanned in HD, as far as I yeah. know. Like there's no release of it. Like you can't buy a, a Blu-ray of any of his movies. I don't think. I don't think on Blu-ray, certainly, yeah. I know there's a BFI DVD that has a lot of them, but still. Yeah. Um, gotta get in touch with Pathé. Yeah, hey, Pathé, BFI, get on that. We want a, we want a 4K re-release of all of Segundo de Chimon's movies. <laughs> I would buy that. I would buy the hell out of that. Oh, hell yeah, that would be amazing. I would go see that in a in a theater, if theaters still exist in, like, a year from now. Womp womp. Um... <laughs> 
Um, which, which one stuck out to you? I mean, the one that stuck out the most certainly was the voyage to Jupiter. Yeah. Which Oof. is sort of, Oof. Uh, I guess, a spiritual sequel to his remake of Trip to the Moon. <laughs> so I, th- I, my thought watching Voyage to Jupiter was uh, uh, his voyage to the moon, his knockoff of Trip to the Moon, was him without his soul in it, you know, without without right. a spirit in it. And Voyage to Jupiter is him uh, doing that space wizards go to space movie, but like the way his that way. he wants to do it. Yeah. 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 Um and I think it was so much better. It was it was amazing. Oh yeah. Um yeah, super like I I don't think Voyage to Jupiter is as good as Trip to the Moon, the mm-hmm. Melies movie, but it is it's a very good like companion piece to it in that it is different and also very cool. Yeah. Um I mean it is more like wizards going to space as you said. <laughs> A uh, classic silent film genre. Um, it has some really, really, like, good, clean, multiple exposure shots. Mm-hmm. There's this sort of the face of in Jupiter, much like the moon. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's like, uh, it's more of just a face. It's not like a pizza face. Kind of like whenever we've right. seen the moon depicted as a face, it's, it's kind of sloppy like, looking. Yeah. Whereas this is just sort of like a much cleaner plate of just like a guy's face on a planet. <laughs> um, and also just like really one thing I noticed about this one is like really nicely composed shots. Not just like aesthetically, but like um, like really good use of space, I guess. Like mm, there's the because beginning- it's a space movie. Right. Um, I mean, like, there's the beginning of the, the wizard guys kind of going out onto a balcony and looking up into the into the sky with a telescope. Yeah. You um, get some POV shots of what they're looking at through the telescope. Yeah, we get some nice POV shots. We get a nice, like, very wide shot from below looking up at them kind of coming out of the balcony, which hmm. really establishes a kind of a sense of scale and, and where they are. And then we punch into, like, a kind of a more of a medium shot. Um, of them actually using the telescope and it's just like it made me think that maybe like three to five years ago this same movie that same sort of sequence of shots would have been like two shots and it wouldn't have had the same sense of scale between different Hmm. you know it's like those two shots are both giving you different information in a very good way this is very like base level filmmaking stuff but it's still for this time i think a, a really good use of the language. Yeah, yeah. And um I mean speaking of of that that shot of them on the balcony, something that I was seeing a lot of this year were uh, was um more involved location shooting, mm-hmm. which yeah. Uh, for sure. It was kind of a rare a bit of a rarity before, at least in narrative film. Um and uh uh, uh, yeah, I saw some like castles and and beaches and you know all this kind of stuff. Yeah, forests, and in this movie all included, kinds of stuff. yeah. Um, um, I the... mean, you were you were speaking of uh, like aesthetic images in this movie, and so, so so this movie, right? It's not an actual voyage to Jupiter, <laughs> right? Um, it's one. It's one of the. It's 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 a dream movies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's mixing the space wizards and the and the, it's a dream genres, yeah. but like, so the wizards kind of dr- like look up at the sky. They want to go to space. They want to visit these planets, uh, Jupiter in particular. Uh, and then the the wizard falls asleep in his giant bed with like posts and very like yeah. ornate stuff on it. The big four poster bed. Yeah. Um, and as as he falls asleep, the uh, it, it dissolves to the bed, uh, the, like the shot stays stable, but then the and and the bed stays stable, but then the shot dissolves into the bed, like sitting on a beach right next to the the water, and like it's like looking out in the skies in the background, and so the guy's sleeping, and you you see that you're going into his dream, but it's such a cool image yeah. of of him in this ornate four poster bed on the beach, and then. <laughs> 
a ladder drops down and he climbs up the ladder to go into space. It's the, it's it's so storybook. It's so yeah. it's beautiful. I love it. It's such a cool image. The coolest part of the movie, I think, is definitely him climbing up the ladder like past different planets. Yeah. Cuz it's it's using an effect that we've seen done a couple times before, which is shooting with the camera looking straight down at the floor, but as if it's looking straight ahead. So it's sort of like they lay a ladder out on the floor and he crawls along it and it, shooting it from straight down. So it looks like he's climbing up. Oh, I guess that is what they did. You know, I, I did. Um, I kind of believed it. <laughs> but that's the thing. They hide it so well because the, the, the way the ladder moves is really good, too. The way the ladder moves is good. The, the different people that he's passing, the sort of he's passing by these planets as if they're just sort of like people sitting on them, kind of yeah. lounging. Like these metaphorical planet people um, the moon and saturn and then jupiter i think yeah and they're you know they don't look like they're sitting on their backs necessarily like they look like they're just sitting around um so yeah it's super super well done really good use of of that effect where i didn't even really notice what it was at first it took me a second to be like oh this is that's how they're doing it yeah i was thinking um, like oh damn like the 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 it, the camera's on a crane going straight up along with them, but I guess that's your answer is probably more um, likely. <laughs> but yeah, e- either way, it's like it's a moving camera going with him too. Um, yeah, which is impressive. through like this really like yeah th- these kind of beautiful uh, uh, fake looking stars in the background, but it's very fanciful. Um, yeah. like you said, it's very it's very storybook. It's not. He's not going for literalism whatsoever here. Yeah, yeah. I love it. It's amazing. Like, I would have, if I, I mean, you could have put this on a kid's show, like a kid's network or something. I would have, like, watched this over and over again if I were, like, four or five years old, you know? I would have loved it. Once he climbs up the Jupiter, he he jumps off the ladder to the planet, and there's this cool shot (sighs) of him, (sighs) like, floating like floating towards camera kind of I well think, it's a I think it's away was, from the camera i think it maybe it's away from the camera like so on on the way down to jupiter you see like the back of him kind of almost swimming falling like away from the camera in the z-axis and then you see all of this um clouds and stuff yeah like moving toward the uh. camera so it's simulating so this, like, pushing in. It looks like he's falling yeah. through the atmosphere of Jupiter. It's amazing. It's, it's great. It's it's really, really cool. I, like, did a double take when that scene happened. Yeah. It was awesome. Um, that shot is in there twice, when he arrives at Jupiter and when he leaves Jupiter. Yeah, I think I think it zooms back in the other direction with yeah. him facing the camera the other way. Um, There's a bit where he, like, dances for the king of Jupiter. Uh-huh. Um... <laughs> where they uh they undercrank it so he kind of speeds up which, yeah have we seen that before i don't think so i think that undercranking like intentionally being used for an effect mm. i don't i don't know if we've seen it before undercranking in this case quite literally cranking the camera slower so that the film is ex- is exposed slower and therefore looks faster it makes sense if you understand how film works moving through a shutter. <laughs> yeah, um, the the end effect is that everyone else is kind of is pretty stable, but he's moving around really quickly all over the place. Yeah. Um it looks like they also maybe I'm not sure what kind of shutter they were using, but it's like he he blurs also. It's it's like uh it's a it's a much it doesn't just look sped up. Like there is an additional amount of blur when he's moving super hmm. quickly, hmm. and that really sells it. I think. Um, wow. So yeah, that's that's a cool thing that we haven't really seen before. Um, an excuse to talk about hand cranking cameras, which is funny. It's yeah. funny that like <laughs> o- over cranking and under cranking are still such commonly used terms, but in this in this instance, that is actually what they were doing. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Um, That's funny. I used I I wrote down overcranking. I guess I got it backwards. Yeah, um, it's because it's inverted. If you overcrank, stuff looks slower because it's you're you're you're, right. you're pulling more frames through the camera, and so there's more frames of it. And if you play it back at the same speed, it looks slower. 
camera things. Um, yeah, he he tries to be friends with the King of Jupiter, but the the King of <laughs> Jupiter is like like playing tricks on him or whatever. He doesn't like yeah. this guy that's coming no. to his kingdom, but he's like messing around with him. He basically like has this like joy buzzer explosion when he tries to shake <laughs> the guy's hand. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot about that part. Uh, yeah, and the king just kind of like harasses him until he leaves <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> yeah, he gets kind of just kind of like chased off of Jupiter. Uh, yeah, but but the king's men, and they they throw him off the planet, and then he flies back yeah. out onto the rope uh, again. Great. Um, um, a note that I had for this movie is this is a music video, which yeah, I don't know if we talked about that much with like, I guess specifically a trip to the moon. Trip to the moon shows up. In so many music videos, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I worked on a music video that had "Trip to the Moon" stuff in it. Oh wow! Um, and this, I mean, this film was, you know, clearly taking a lot from that one, also. But I was just like, oh, these old silent movies have such like kind of music video logic to them too. Okay. Yeah. 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 I can see it. Yeah. I do feel like music videos owe a lot to this era of filmmaking hmm i mean music videos are are the place where a lot of visionary directors get to flesh like uh flex their kind of um yeah their, their kind of weirdness their dream logic and whatever and i think that th- that kind of thing was more uh in the air with with these types mm-hmm. of movies and more more doable i suppose right well i think i think especially like thinking about like 80s and 90s music videos when it was just sort of like more of a new thing and it was sort of like mm-hmm. do whatever you want do something crazy like true yeah and two new mediums that's kind of where we're at now where it's like they've established enough that they kind of know what some of the rules are but then they're also constantly breaking them and doing new things um and the uh this ends with the the guy he's climbing back down the rope <laughs> and then the and then because he he's just getting completely messed kicked around by all of these celestial beings <laughs> uh the the saturn guy he climbs down da- down below the saturn guy and the saturn guy takes up takes out this huge pair of scissors and then chops his rope ladder and so he falls all the way back down to earth and it becomes a falling dream and he smacks onto the ground and then wakes up in his bed. Yeah. Um, oh, wonderful movie. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, there are a couple other cool Dishamon films from this year. I don't know how much we have to say about them. Um, yeah. Well, let me let me actually uh, uh, do this other side detail. Uh, okay. Uh, once more. Is that The Voice of Jupiter has great color. Um, mm. We've talked about the Pathé stencil color a bit. Um, but I, I was reading into today uh, the the process of the Pathé stencil color. Have you have you looked into this? Um, a little bit, not really. I was I looked at it and I said that's confusing, and I looked away. And then <laughs> I think I, then, I think that's what I did as well. Yeah, I, I kind of dug into it, and so Segundo de Chimon invented the coloring process for Pathé uh, called mm-hmm. Pathé color, um, and. The process is really cool, and I guess this is what was done to Voyage to Jupiter and all the other color Pathé films, is they take um, they take multiple copies of the black and white film, and they, they use those as the stencils. So what what they do is they they take the initial copy, and someone uses a stylus that's attached to a big machine that records or like tr- transits the stylus's movement to a knife on uh another uh on, on another piece of film so they, they take the film they project it onto a glass plate so it's a little bigger and he can get it more precise the person will draw along the edges of where the color of where a particular color needs to be and it will that it will translate that motion into cutting that exact thing out on a smaller piece of film that, that, that can be laid over the film, basically. And so they do that over and over again for each frame and each color. And then... Uh, they'll, so they'll take the, the yellow frame, or the, or the yellow reel of film, right? And they'll just spool it out precisely on top 
of the other one and then roll over it with yellow color and all of the yellow stuff's cut out and then then they'll take another one that's a, a copy of the film that has the green parts cut out and they'll roll over it with a color roller. Wow. And so that's that's how it's done. It's a lot more uh, uh, mass producible than a hand done Melies style. Yeah, but and much cleaner thought, too. Yeah, yeah. The Pathé color looks really great. It does. But these these are black and white. Um, mm. Which which one do you want to head, head um, to first? I mean, they're, they're pretty much, I think we can do this kind of uh, lightning round, just kind of punch through them. I mean, the Invisible Thief is kind of cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's a about... new effect we haven't seen. Have Have we seen? I thought we we might have seen it done not as well before once. Really, I don't remember. I could be wrong. I could be thinking of something else. Um. um well, it's a guy who um, discovers an invisibility potion. Well, I was reading reading a, like like the uh, description of it and it is it's supposed to be he finds the book the invisible man by hd wells oh <laughs> and then just reads like the ingredients of how to make an invisibility potion from that book and he, he oh. just has that stuff in his apartment already that's funny yes um, he has invisible light vaporine and fluidice yeah i i too wrote those <laughs> things down because they're incredible um yeah, he just he's just like, oh, I got those right here. Like these are just in my cabinet. Um, and uh, yeah, he just goes around and causes mischief because he's the invisible thief, and that's kind of what Invisible Man stories are usually all about. Yeah, I mean, I, this is the I think I saw this called like the first semi adaptation of Invisible Man. It's kind of funny how mm. we get these adaptations that are like the the George Melies. Um, arabian nights thing which are like kind of arabian nights but mm-hmm. just kind of not also and this one uh invisible man came out about a decade before and uh it it is a somewhat of a of an adaptation um, it's also but it's like kind of a cheeky like comedic adaptation yeah. you know it's like we're not gonna like gonna straight it's kind of like ooh, they like found the book and i was gonna do the thing from the book yeah um, um and yeah, like there was the Meliers was like 200 miles under the sea or it was some other right similar title. Yeah. It was like kind of adapting certain scenes from it, but it was also kind of a parody. I guess um, that might be this case as well. Um, the first Sherlock Holmes movie is very much like a parody mm. of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Which is, it's it's interesting how these really early like adaptations from literature are sort of like, look at this dumb story. <laughs> not that but i mean like they're they're all done in a in a sort of like comedic wink winky way they're not really not many of them are kind of straight adaptations well you know it's not until around now where we're actually seeing people giving drama an honest stab um, yeah we've seen it a little bit um with like uh capilani in particular yeah. has done a lot of, yeah. sort of melodrama stuff mm-hmm. but yeah definitely once DW gets into it, he starts doing a lot. But we'll get yeah. into that in a second. We'll get yeah. Um I, I mean, if we haven't seen this invisibility effect before, I thought it was really, really cool. Um yeah. I guess what happens is that when he turns invisible, they do a jump cut to him probably painted all black. Like his skin painted I he's all painted. black. I think he's probably wearing like um hosiery. What is yeah. it called? A stocking, sure. <laughs> I'm I'm but, guessing he's yeah he's wearing some sort of like yeah. dark, uh, fabric. So, so the effect of that being that the the black fabric doesn't show up when they're doing the double exposure. It almost it shows up as nearly clear, mm-hmm. which is actually really great because. It's using that thing that's an artifact in a lot of this double exposure stuff of you can kind of see one of the exposures uh, mm-hmm. to show that like his skin is mostly see through, but you can still see the the shape of it, which is really great. Yeah. Um. And so he he takes all of his clothes off, and so you can see like one invisible arm taking the. It's 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 great. It, yeah. It's a wonderful effect. I mean, it's 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 a little bit jankier than. Like the Invisible Man movie from the 30s, 
but not by that much. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's very much just like oh yeah, it's an invisible guy. Like they're only exposing for his like clothes, and the rest of him doesn't show up on the film, so he's he's invisible. Yeah. Um, and it's it looks great. Yeah, it it shows off his invisible thievery. Uh, yeah. uh, his his invisibility is done in different ways at different points in the movie, and one of the ways it's done is with uh, stop motion, where you know you can't see hands moving these mm-hmm. items. So he's kind of stealing all of the uh, uh, fancy I don't know china and golden cups or whatever from rich people <laughs> from a rich person's house, and he all loads it up in a cups sack got lying around. Yeah. <laughs> um. And there's one point where he wants to be seen, and so he puts on this creepy, like, Michael Myers mask. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's sort of an Invisible Man staple, is, like, putting on the, the sort of that, yeah. false face or the wrapping the head. That's true. Um, yeah. Uh, the, he's got, he's wearing, like, a uh, like a checkered suit, a very distinctive mm-hmm. checkered suit, which yeah. is, so it's like when you see him... Uh, it's I like how it's distinct distinctive enough that even if you can't see his face or his hands, it's like it's very clear who it is. Besides, it's true. The, besides yeah. the fact that he's invisible, which is um, helpful. That kind of thing is helpful in in these old movies because sometimes it's blurry and it's on YouTube and it's distant. Everyone's just wearing uh, like black tailcoats, and it's like I don't know right. who any of these people are. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So I appreciated that. Um, <laughs> Do more of that, old movie people. Um, there's another kind of similar film, a little bit less focused than the The Invisible Thief, called Slippery Jim. Uh, did you watch this one? No, I, I had that on my list, but I didn't uh, um, end up getting around to it. It's it's also a a thief, sort of using semi supernatural means to escape from capture and just to cause mischief um it's but it's there's even less of a sense of logic to it like it's not oh he makes a put it's he just kind of is magic Mm -hmm. um he just is a a tune i don't know um (laughs) but the first thing is like they they uh he's in jail and the the guards sort of manacle his arms and legs and then we get a a a close-up of his feet and his feet, in stop motion, unscrew themselves and come off. And then he escapes the shackles that way. Um, there's a bit where he, like, flattens himself to escape a chest. Um, then the the cop, he keeps escaping all these things that the cops are trying to, like, you know, uh, capture him with. And so finally they just throw him in a bag and throw him in a river, which is like, Whoa! <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> First of all, that's murder. And also, that's kind of the easy... Like, you don't have to have powers to escape that. You just gotta, like, get out of the bag, which is what he does. Um, but I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They got... This escalated quickly. Um, uh, he, like, builds himself a bicycle. Uh, and then, like, rides a bicycle on top of a train. It's a wild movie. Um... Uh, he rides through a cop and like slices him in half, and then he has to that cop has to get stuck back together, like sliced oh my God. down the middle. Like he he rides through him on the bicycle. Um, there's a bit. This really stuck out to me. There's a bit at near the end where there's a uh, like a, a jail door that closes, and he walks through the jail door through a substitution splice. Like they just cut of him behind the door and then in front of the door as if he kind of. Oh, like Terminator phases. 2 style? Exactly like Terminator 2. <laughs> like, it's the same thing. I was like, oh, this is just Terminator 2. What the I'm looking, Cameron? I'm looking through it right now, and there's a part where his bicycle is flying, and you see it flies over a river, and you see his reflection in the, riv- in the river. Yeah, they duplicate it, so he's in the river. Also, It's it's wild. Oh, I need to watch this movie. Ah. <laughs> um, so that one's neat. Um, there's, uh, did you watch Sweet Dreams Intermingled with Nightmares? Uh, yes. (laughs) Um, that one I don't really have a lot to say. It's a woman falls asleep on a park bench and just has wacky dreams. Um, 
there's one really cool transition with the fountain. I'm trying to remember exactly how it's done. It's like using multiple exposures to sort of have a fountain come up in the foreground and then the background will change to a different scene and then the the uh the fountain will fade away. Hmm. So it's sort of like, hey, look at a fountain, and then while you're looking at the fountain, the scene changes behind it, and then it's like a different scene now. That's cool. Um That's something we haven't really seen before, and it's it's approaching like more modern editing techniques, but it's not quite doing the huh. same thing. Um I don't know that that really stuck out to me as like a cool thing that I don't really think we've seen before. Another another kind of uh, funky one that he made this year was the Traveler's Nightmare. Mm. Um, Traveler's Nightmare, also known as a panicky picnic or an incoherent excursion, which is <laughs> those are my better. <laughs> an incoherent excursion is, I think, my favorite one. Um, I mean that's. That's, I think, the most literal translation from the French title. Okay. Which is like, l'excursion incoherente, or some some Frenchy sounding thing like that. <laughs> um, yeah, this one's this one's a kind of a an a, a segundo de chamon, a very him effects showcase. Yeah. Basically, I have um, definitely seen the last scene of this before, and I do not know where. The one with the big head? The one with the where they're like outside the inn and there's a big head and there's a well and there's a snake coming out of the well and a crocodile on the roof and huh. it's just It's chaos. I, yeah, <laughs> it's just abject chaos. Um I've definitely seen it before and I do not know where. And it is, is it is eating me up inside. But oh, I was man. like, Oh, this scene. Wow. Huh. Um It might have been in like a film class many, many years ago. It might have been like a clip used in something else since this is a public domain movie. I don't know. More people get on De Chimon. I was telling all these people about, um, oh my God, what's it? The legend of a ghost. Oh um, yeah. I just today I was telling a friend about legend of a ghost. I was like, yeah, I'm like, watch you got, movie. you got to watch this. This movie is <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, the traveler's nightmare. It's, it's like five minutes long and it's just nonstop like funky effects um yeah there uh it, it's kind of a classic like some people go into a haunted hotel and bad yeah. things happen movie. any any hotel in a silent movie is haunted <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um so they 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 start out with a picnic and they cut a sausage and it turns into bugs yeah uh and then they take out some eggs and the eggs turn into rats and then they take out a cake, and it turns into worms. Yeah. Uh, when they cut your, it, your cake is worms. Your cake is worms, and these are done with like substitution splices and a bit of uh, stop motion. And real worms, I think, for for the worms. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is. Oh my god, what what turns? There's like this claymation in it, which I think is the first time we've ever seen claymation. Well, um, we've seen something similar in one of the previous. Uh, or maybe multiple previous haunted hotel movies where like the outside of the hotel turns into was a it face. clay? I wasn't sure. I believe in one of them it was clay. Okay, as, as it is in this one, when it's like it's what it's like the the teapot. Yeah, makes changes into a face. Yeah, well, it's like um, this one's like really close in on it, unlike the yeah. houses, I guess. So you can see the the you know, the thumbprints and you can see it kind of shifting into a face. Yeah. Which the is face really makes great. It a bit more, has a bit more expressive too, which is cool. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of people think of Emil Cole or J Stuart Blackton as fathers of animation. Um, but again, people sleep on De Chimon because like he is basically the father of stop motion animation. He's oh, doing yeah. way more of it and he's doing, he's doing it way more competently than anyone else right now. I don't, I mean, I don't think you, t- you can say that he invented it because I don't believe he did. No. But it's like he might as well have. Like, he's the first guy to really use it like we think of it. Yeah. Um, And yeah, that's... I had never heard of Segundo de Shimon before doing this podcast. Yeah. And yeah, like all of his movies are amazing. He's, he's doing so many crazy innovative things. And it's like... Ugh. This whole like... <laughs> early 1900s like pre-1920s era is very slept on i'm realizing 
True. People yeah. don't want to watch eight minute silent movies, apparently. But they're great. They're so much easier to watch. And we're watching we're watching and tons of free. them, so you don't have to, yeah. <laughs> exactly. They're they're the easiest, most accessible movies you can possibly watch. Um uh, do you want to do any more Chamon or should we I don't, I don't move really on. Think I have anything else to say about Chamon, so we should move on. Okay. Um I guess to sort of the the main guy this year, the sort of most prolific Okay, well, um, yeah, let's go on to let's go on to the big daddy. <laughs> uh, can't escape um, it. D.W. We're talking about D.W. Griffith. Um, I refuse to refer to D.W. Griffith as as the big daddy. <laughs> oh yeah, we. <laughs> oh my god, what is this? Uh, uh, the the drill tweet, like, oh my god. There is a drill tweet for every occasion. Yeah, it's that remains true. Okay, so I'm going to re- read this drill tweet and replace the word ISIS with the word DW <laughs> Griffith. Um, issuing a correction on a previous post of mine regarding the terror <laughs> regarding the filmmaker DW Griffith. You do not, under any circumstances, gotta hand it to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, D.W. Griffith. A lot of people hand it to him. A lot of people hand... I mean, okay, look. I... You know, I don't want to be known as the guy who liked the the KKK movie uh, from... Or, or who likes D.W. Griffith. I understand what people are going for, though. I think these yeah. movies are so much more mature storytelling yeah. than we see in, like, anything else. Um, I... You know, he didn't... He didn't invent cross-cutting, but I think he made it a big part of his style. Yeah. The the cross cutting in in the movies that he made this year definitely stuck out to me. It's like, "Oh shit, this is like actual cross cutting and he's using it to like build tension." Yeah. And uh yeah, it's just it's it's much more kind of thoughtful and more deliberate use of editing. Yeah, and I I think the acting it probably works a lot better than other attempts at at dramatic acting so far mm-hmm. in silent films he's he's doing this thing which i've seen in in later silent films where people have um really distinct like dark makeup on their eyes like eyeshadow mm-hmm. and stuff and it it doesn't look quite real but it it really helps you hone in on their emotions when yeah. the camera's more pulled back it, it accentuates a lot of their eye and brow movements and like yeah um I yeah, feel it, like you're, it makes you're, a lot of their expressions read a lot more easily. In in Corn and Wheat and some of these other ones, he's telling story. He's telling like narratives that are more complex or like emotionally invested than a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Um. So um, yeah. Well, like more in line with what like Capilani is doing. Yeah. Or I think who else? I, I think this is better than of. the Capilani that I've seen at least. Um, yeah, for the most part, it's, it's, it's a little better. Um, yeah. it's not that different, but it, I think the, the, the good editing does kind of push it over the edge. Yeah, I um, suppose that's true. Um, one that is not particularly that impressive, but I want to talk about is those awful hats. I know you do. Okay. You want to, you want to go to that one instead of corner and weed or, uh, well, I just, I just shout out to those awful hats. Okay. It's yes, another, I, it, I knew you would. I knew you would fixate on this one. I mean, yeah. it's it's another big hat satire, and I've read yeah. so much about the whole big hat fad of the 1900s that I'm like, this is the most direct reference to it. Where it is, the entire plot of this movie is women have giant hats, and we hate it. Yeah, and down in front. <laughs> it also made me miss movie theaters because it's it's about a movie theater of people trying to watch a movie, and just increasingly large hats st- start coming in and blocking <laughs> people's view um and at, at the end it says ladies please remove your hats um or not not before a crane reaches down from the sky yes true. and and first takes someone's hat off their head like a full size like construction yeah. crane and then and then the, the next one comes down and just lifts this this lady completely um completely out of yeah. the theater 
because this, her hat's too big. This was the the please turn off your cell phones PSA of 1909. I'm kind of surprised that we never used this at Alamo, you know? <laughs> yeah, me too. I have seen um, ladies please remove your hats before in context with movies. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if that phrase comes from this movie or not, but it might. Um, it does have like a weird, like early... Maybe it's a matte effect. I'm not really sure to have the film I, on screen. This, yeah, I don't like. I didn't see anyone talking about this, but it's it's. Yeah, they it, have the it movie. Looks, it looks like a matte and not a double exposure to me, which is like it looks like they instead of just exposing the film twice, they uh-huh. definitely sort of like had a thing covering up part of it, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how they did it. But, it, but was, it, it tracks around the folds and 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 shapes in their yeah. hats too. So it's not just like flat, kind of like you know, it's not just another layer, just kind of thrown on top of just like we ran the film through the camera twice. It's like yeah, it's cut out when people move past it. So it's so it's like cut out on a frame by frame basis. You're saying possibly? I'm not sure. I couldn't yeah. find any information about it. I, yeah, curious. I don't know how it's done, but it almost seems like early green screen looking thing, you know? Yeah. Um, um, wild. Um, but yeah, we can get to the good movies now. Um, I that was the, good. Those Awful Hats was good. Those Awful Hats is good. Um, it was enjoyable. Um, yeah, Corner and Wheat is probably the most impressive movie. Uh, like, narrative movie this year. Yeah. Um, it's very uh, I don't know one of my notes for it is just America man (laughs) Um, yeah I mean it's it's uh, political before D.W. Griffith political meant yikes (laughs) well yeah I mean two things about it is another note I have is this movie is surprisingly lefty for D.W. yeah Um, um yeah, like a working man versus evil corporate guy thing. Yeah. I'm always interested when these movies engage in that kind of stuff, like Edwin S. Porter did, because there's no way that the people making these movies aren't rich, you know? Like, the, the people who are... I mean, maybe, right? Like, the people who are at least funding them, um, these these people who have access to cameras and cars and, and whatnot, uh, uh, they've... T.W. Griffith and... Edwin S. Porter, they've got to be like wealthy people, but they seem to understand labor and and it, or not labor, but like income inequality issues. You know. Yeah, I I think they're they're they are certainly like wealthy for their time and for their uh I don't know whatever like um New York City surroundings. Yeah, I mean I I don't, but I don't think they're like. You know, I don't think Edison would have made this movie. You know, it's like there, there's like mm-hmm. they have money, and they're like clearly they they're in, in a place where they have m- lots of means to be able to just like do these things and start their own film companies and stuff. But they're not like Edison is like a a enormous you know corporate overlord. You know, right? It's like so it's, the villain of this movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's I do think there's a sense of like. They know what's up a little bit more than someone like he would. They're not these like completely evil monsters, monstrous like wealthy uh, barons. Right. Um, uh, at least not at this point. Um, but yeah, this one. I mean, it does. It does feature a monstrous baron, basically. Yeah. Um, the wheat baron. Uh, or no, the what is it? The wheat king. The wheat king. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i'd actually thought before knowing anything about this movie that i thought it was like referring to some street corner where they uh sold wheat but it is about a a wheat baron uh who is cornering the wheat market and basically he's like engaging in some kinds of trades so that he can completely monopolize the wheat market and as he does that uh, he puts all of these wheat farmers out of business, and he raises the wheat prices so that bread is, like, doubling in price. And so there are all of these poor people who are getting in line um, and trying to buy bread, and they find out that it's 
gone from five cents to ten cents and they can't afford it some can't afford it and some and there's like a shortage of wheat uh to make it more in demand i guess and uh so people are going hungry and starving and it is juxtaposing that through cross cutting Mm -hmm. uh with this baron living it up being super wealthy having parties with his rich friends and just like you know your blood boils yeah you're 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 watching uh it's funny because like this is a a cross cut that's not necessarily happening at the same time uh Mm -hmm. but it's being used to juxtapose like a theme instead of uh a a time instead of action yeah 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 it's it's um it works very well like you understand that these two things are sort of happen happening concurrently and sort of yeah. the relationship between between them um you know we established beforehand the the sort of uh bakery where people are buying bread and the offices of this wealthy wheat king um there is spoilers there's a great bit where <laughs> the wheat king is showing people around his like wheat factory and then falls in because he's reading he's reading a note of how much money he made. <laughs> yeah, he gets a and, telegram saying you got four million dollars from and so he's like owning oh, the he- wheat market. <laughs> he's like oh hell yeah! And so then he's so distracted by that that he falls into his own wheat processing and gets buried yeah. in wheat. Yeah, a very uh, and, poetic and, end. Mm-hmm. Um, poetic justice for this uh, billionaire villain. Yeah. Um, or millionaire. But um yeah, and you just like see see his hand like in at reaching out of the wheat and he's calling for help, but he just suffocates and dies, and then his friends uh pull him out eventually and they just inspect the dead body and they go, Wow. Oh dang, he's dead. Are we are we the true bad guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um I did read that. Uh, D.W. Griffith had sort of avoided making political statements in films before this one. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one was very successful. And he was like, hey, I should do more of that. Uh, whoops. Whoops. <laughs> well, it's not bad yet. I mean, no. the thing is that D.W. Griffith made over 100 movies this year. Yeah. Um, so we didn't watch all of them. Not even no. close. No. <laughs> I think like actually... Five. Like, it would be interesting to... If we were to go back to this era uh, uh, at some point, if we were to just go through as many of the mm. Griffith movies as possible, because he made a ton of movies in 1908, 1909, 1910, 1911. Um, he made just dozens and dozens of movies each year. And they're all, you know, kind of a lot of them are very serious dramas but, yeah. that he was trying to like uh, flex his, his chops on the, on the art form. So, um, there was another one, uh, the Lonely Villa, which ah, the Lonely Villa, uh, is another kind of dramatic thing. I don't think it's nearly as good. Um, it's much more simple. Mm-hmm. Something that you might have seen previously. It's it's more of a a taut thriller. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, apparently, it's based on this French pot, play pot called boiler. At the Telephone. A what? A pot boiler, a pot I believe boiler. Is the term. Uh-huh. Like 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 the steam's about to yeah like sim- like a pressure sim- cooker simmering kind of thing. tension. Yeah yeah yeah. Um, I understand the metaphor. Yeah. Um, this this is really where like the cross cutting really stuck out to me. It's like oh this is tense. Yeah, and this is also three different scenes cross cut, mm-hmm. which is the first time. This is the first time that's at, that that's ever been done mm. apparently. Um, uh, there, there are, the the basic setup is that there are some robbers who are trying to, uh, break into these rich people, this rich people's house and steal their stuff. And, uh, they, they wait until the man of the house is gone because it's, I don't know, because it's 1909 (laughs) and people are sexist. Um, uh, so the, the man of the house leaves and he... Uh, as soon as he's gone, they you try to rob the house with this old man in the house. Will never succeed. <laughs> um, and so the guy's out in town doing stuff, 
And then the robbers are trying to break in the door and uh, the the wife and the two kids are um, trying to barricade the door and freaking out uh, because they're being attacked. Um, and so it's cutting between these three things. And eventually he calls home and they say, come back home, help, we're <laughs> being attacked. And so that's when the tension really rises uh, because it's cutting between the thieves working to break down the door, the guy trying to make his way back to the house to defeat the thieves, and then the 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 family cowering and trying to defend themselves. Uh, and yeah, it like increases the speed of the of the cuts to uh, bring that tension up there. Yeah, probably the most some of the most like uh, explicit, I guess editing. St- like where it's like the editing is the thing that is doing the most of the heavy lifting in this one as opposed to hmm yeah like cool sets or performance i mean the performance is a big part of it too um but this one's very e- editing forward yeah um, i thought something that i thought was cool about the performance in this one was that uh when the thieves first come to the house uh, the the family realizes what's happening uh, be, by hearing what's happening outside. Mm. And uh, you can tell by the way they're acting that they're hearing something scary outside, which um, it's kind of like summoning that missing sound in your head a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, by, by making sure that someone is responding... Uh, in not like a cartoonish way, but in a in a kind of exaggerated way to a sound that they're hearing, and that like they kind of you see the door in front of you, and then you see the 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 wife going like, oh my god, you know, and and you can tell that she's hearing through the door what's happening. Yeah, it's very very clean storytelling in this one. There's yeah, there's not a lot of intertitles. I don't think. I don't. Remember yeah, I don't think anyway. so. Um. But yeah, it's 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 very easy to follow. It's very clear what's happening in every shot. It's like, um, I was never like, "What's going on here?" Um, which even some of the other DW Griffith movies I watched from this year, I was there are a couple of parts where I was like, "When is this supposed to be?" Yeah, Corner and Week got like a little confusing at the points. Um, but... yeah, this one is like because it is so simple and it is such a like a a taut thriller. Um, yeah. This even has uh, it works a well. cutting the telephone lines scene. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, maybe the first, the first time one that's of those. Yeah. It's, not, it's not the first home invasion movie because there was a Star Films home invasion film, I think, from 1908. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's pretty close. Um, hmm. One big thing, I mean, I guess I'll use this opportunity to talk about it. Um, a big thing this year, 1909, um, that sort of kind of began a shift is that movie stars are kind of a thing now. Yeah. Um, and they haven't really been before. As best I could tell, trying to like research it, uh, 1909 is the first instance of a a film actor um, being used to like create publicity for a film, like hmm. the actor being kind of the thing to draw the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause they and, were pretty anonymous up until this point. Yeah. And like their name being used is not, has not been a thing like very deliberately up until around this point. Um, Studios do not give any credit to film actors because they didn't want them to gain status or recognition because then they would ask for more money. <laughs> so they're like, no, no, classic. You, you're all anonymous. Like, no one can know who you are. Yeah, classic turn of the century, terrible business people. <laughs> yeah. Um, keep keeping the theme here. Um, but that started to change in 1909 when um, Max Linder, the French uh, comedic film actor, um, they used his name to promote uh, a film that I could not find. 
um, called The Little Young Man. Hmm. Um, Max Linder films have kind of been happening in the background, and we haven't really been watching them, which is too bad because I went back and rewatched a bunch, and they're really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, Max Linder is like the 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 precursor to Charlie Chaplin in a very literal way. Like Charlie Chaplin straight up said, like, "Oh yeah, I just learned everything that I'm doing from him." Apparently, including uh, the the cane the cane spinning that Char- is a famous yeah. Charlie Chaplin thing was taken from Max Linder. Um, but he's been making movies since about 1905. His sort of like famous film persona has been around since 1907. Um, he made a film in 1905 called The Legend of Punching, which I could not find when I'm very upset about. Great title. Um, <laughs> and so, but, and then two other sort of like people who, so Max Linder is, as far as I can tell, the closest thing to the first movie star that exists. Yeah, and international, definitely. Yeah, uh, um, but two other people that are sometimes credited as the first movie star are both um, both biograph people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Florence Lawrence, which is a great name, yeah. um, who is uh, Canadian-American and is, according to Wikipedia, often credited as the first movie star, even though I'd, I'd never heard of her before looking this up. Um, her first movie was the Automobile Thieves, which we watched. Um, and she worked a Vitagraph before moving to Biograph and getting really popular. And because actors' names weren't a thing, people just called her the Biograph Girl because she kept showing up and stuff. Um, in 1909, she left Biograph, uh, to join the Independent Moving Pictures Company of America. Um... Mm -hmm which is kind of this other upstart film company. Um, yeah, that's one of the ones that isn't in the pact. And so they were uh, both getting sued by Edison and uh, uh, making <laughs> making feature yeah. films earlier than Edison. Um, but there's this big publicity stunt when, when she moved to that company where the, the head of the IMP, uh, Carl L- uh, Lamel, I'm not entirely sure how you say his name, um uh said started a rumor that the biograph girl had been killed in a car accident and then revealed to the news what? that she was that she was actually alive and her name was Florence Lawrence and they were making movies for her for his company and it was that's just an insane thing to do. Whoa. Um but it worked and it made a bunch of publicity. After Florence Lawrence left Biograph, uh Another actress kind of got labeled as the biograph girl, and that person was Mary Pickford, who is the person I had sort of thought of as the first movie star. Right. Um, she's, I think, probably the most widely recognized now. Yeah, I think she's maybe the first, the earliest movie star that had a career continuing into, you know, feature films that we yeah. remember today. Yeah. Um, yeah, her, her career lasted many decades. Um, so yeah, she definitely had the most kind of like longevity within her lifetime. Um, but so after Florence Lawrence left, she kind of became the biograph girl until she also started getting kind of too big and getting credit under her own name. Um, which is funny. Uh, but yeah, both Florence Lawrence and Mary Pickford appear in a bunch of these dw dw griffith movies um i think mary pickford is in lonely villa i believe she's in that one but her first movie the first movie she was ever in is two memories another griffith movie which is part of a a sort of subgenre of dw griffith films that i call the oops they're dead movies (laughs) because there's a lot of those uh huh. Um, the uh, it's a this one I found a little hard to follow without the synopsis. The Library of Congress yeah. synopsis for it is: Henry and Marion have a lover's quarrel and part in anger. They do not reconcile, and ten years pass without contact. Marion becomes a society girl and spends her time at parties with her friends. Henry becomes very ill and wishes to see Marion one more time. He writes asking her to visit. She when she. When she receives the note, she laughs and tosses it on the floor. 
but later on a whim decides to take all her drunken friends with her to visit him. When they arrive, Marion finds Henry dead, clutching her portrait in his hand. Uh, she sends Jeez. her friends away and falls to her knees in remorse. Hey, what a fun plot for a movie. Um, <laughs> I mean, if he's pumping out two a week. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but so Mary Pickford is Marion's uh, uh, sister in this movie, I think. Um, this one also has a bunch of intercutting. We see, so we see the, the lovers quarrel and then we see intercut these sort of parallel lives that they, they've been living of Marion being the society girl and having parties and Henry being alone and ill and sad. Well, yeah, I mean, um, this, it, it's not intercut with the quarrel though, because the, the, the confusing no. thing about this movie, well, what, what the initial the confusing, things? yeah. The initial confusing thing about this movie is that that ten year passage is just in a single cut, and yeah. it just looks like you're looking at different characters, and you yeah. don't know what's going. on. They have on. slightly different makeup. It's it's not really it's not very um, it's not a very good movie, but it's no. it's notable for being the first movie that Mary Pickford ever was in. Um, mm-hmm. She was seventeen when they made that movie, which is also kind of crazy. Yeah, I was I was just looking at the Lonely Villa. She is in it. She's not the um she's not the wife though. She's the oldest yeah. daughter. Yeah. Um some of their Oops They Died movies. Um there was an Edgar Allan Poe uh I guess biopic uh <laughs> that he made which is just loosely based on Edgar Allan Poe's actual life, but it's it's based on the fact that uh his his wife Virginia uh, was super sick and he's just off trying to write the raven and she she dies while he's off trying to sell his uh <laughs> sell his poem mm-hmm. um there's so many movies of like people dying yeah, guess... people dying in beds while yeah the country else doctor is... is another one of those the country doctor is very much another oops oops they died movie <laughs> um also sort of another kind of like pastoral story like a corner in wheat yeah um both, I mean, uh, dw those... griffith grew up in kentucky which explains his later yeah. racism um <laughs> and also his love of pastoral like farmland scenes yeah yeah um both country doctor and corner and wheat have really good opening shots especially country doctor i think yeah it's this really big panor- uh, panorama that uh just kind of sweeps over this this valley this this farm valley which is really nice which is a nice shot to begin with but then it also it's like we start on a landscape we pan along the landscape and we end on the country doctor and his family and so we're using camera movement to reveal characters mm. which is mm-hmm. i don't think entirely a new thing but it's still notable as like a rarity the um, other notable thing about uh, the country doctor, I don't know how how much we want to get into it, is uh, that the movie ends with a reverse of that mm-hmm. panorama. Yeah, and uh, it it there's a there's a title card that says tragedy has fallen over the valley because <laughs> basically what happens in the movie is that there's a doctor, his daughter gets sick, and then another kid gets sick, and he goes to tend to the other kid and while he's tending to the other kid his daughter dies and he comes home and oops oops she died she died uh and then so he's sad and then the movie's over this is the kind of stuff like this is what i'm talking about why i i'm i kind of respect dw griffith because he's going for like like darker more complex more mature stuff than i think a lot of people are doing yeah um but Anyway, the movie ends. It, it says tragedy has fallen over the valley, and then it does a reverse of that mm. pan, and you're lo- you're looking at it with this context of there's yeah. tragedy here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's simple but but very effective. Yeah, um, I think the only other movie of his that I really have anything to say about is A Trap for Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, that's Which a fun is a, one. A great title. I was a little bit disappointed by it because I was expecting something a bit more, I think, akin to, um, oh man, what was the Porter Santa Claus movie? Uh, 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 the little girl, the little, the little girl, girl who, who didn't did believe not believe in Santa, in Santa Claus. I think yeah. this is much better and more fun than this one. This one's well, this one's just really dour and like sad and dark. 
this is a per- this is a perfect example of what's different about Porter yeah. is that or not Porter about um, Griffith is that uh, all of the Santa movies that we've seen so mm-hmm. far portray Santa as a real person because movies yeah. were fanciful and fun until this sad boy came <laughs> until along. He you came know, along. Uh, and so <laughs> this is the first movie that we, that we've seen where Santa is not real. He's a guy in a suit, you know, yeah. he's, he's the parent basically. Um, and, uh, there's a poor family. So this is another class movie too. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the family is, is destitute and poor and, uh, the dad resorts to drinking, uh, his problems away. And, uh, he and he comes home drunk and he's all embarrassed and he writes a note and says that uh the family will be better off without him and so he goes away to live on his own and be sad while the rest of the family is sad that their dad left and mm. uh and suffers another uh, uh recurring actor in a lot of these movies is uh Gladys Egan who played Dolly in Adventures of Dolly she plays the daughter in Trap for Santa Claus. She is the youngest daughter in Lonely Villa. And she is the kid who dies in Country Doctor. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, I should start she's knowing She's very good actors. at playing creepy, sickly Victorian children. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so while, while the family is sad, um, they th- some lawyers knock on the door and say, hey... Uh, your your aunt whose will was in litigation uh turns out that you get her mansion and and all of her stuff and so uh right after the dad leaves basically um they they become i believe the movie calls them a they get a moderate fortune <laughs> um, <laughs> moderate a, fortune you know not not too big a fortune just uh, you know yeah um upper upper middle class i would say they go from yeah. they go from poor to upper upper middle class um and the the mom is still yeah you know, it's yeah it's it's Christmas Eve and the mom is really sad that um that the dad isn't there to celebrate Christmas with them the kids uh she she tell th- th- there's no there's no chimney in the house that it's it makes a right. point of mentioning so Santa's gonna come in through the window yeah and so the kids want to set a trap for Santa Claus to okay. to just it doesn't yeah. happen. But I was 100% sure that either the mom or dad was going to dress up as Santa Claus and the kids were going to accidentally murder them. Because that was that was the entire vibe this movie has set up. It's like, this movie is dark, it is dour, it is creepy. Yeah. Um, it didn't help. I mean, the the score that would, was put on it on the YouTube that I watched is, like, dissonant and spooky. Oh, man. <laughs> like, too, like, too much of a, like pushing it too far it was like this movie isn't that creepy the score is making it much worse Um, i was thinking that this this has the 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 christmas melancholy of it's a wonderful life but it doesn't have the wholesomeness and happy ending it's a wonderful life it it skips over all the cheer also i guess it does have a happy ending but yeah it (laughs) does um yeah the 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 dad who is now living as a like a, a burglar um We've kind of seen this a similar plot to this before. The dad breaks into the house not knowing that the family lives there now. Because mm-hmm. he just sees a big fancy house and he's like, I'm going to break in and steal their, their golden cups. It might have been the first time that he was a burglar. I think he was just, like, starving and he needed yeah. to steal something. Um, yeah. yeah, so the the dad breaks in, uh, reconciles with the mom. And decides to dress up as Santa Claus for the kids. I forget where the trap actually happens. That part gets kind of lost. Uh, I think they trigger... They intentionally trigger the obvious trap that the kids have set. And then the mom runs in and says, I think we've caught Santa Claus. And then oh, it's their right. dad. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Um, uh, yeah, it's their dad. Which and it's, it's a nice ending. It is a nice ending. And I think the moment early on where... Or, or earlier when the mom is dressing up as Santa... And uh, she's sitting there, like you can, you can without intertitles, you can tell that she is like upset that you know her husband isn't there to take part in this, mm-hmm. and so she's like sitting there sulking 
as she's putting on a Santa outfit, and it's kind of it's kind of sad, you know. And yeah, I mean, the image of someone crying and putting on a Santa Claus outfit is inherently <laughs> dramatic enough that it's like it's gonna elicit a reaction one yeah. way or another. Yeah. Um, another recurring uh, player in this is Max Sennett, who plays the bartender in the scenes where the dad is going to get drunk. Um, who throws him out of the bar. But Max Sennett uh, will go on to become a a, uh, a well-known and successful comedy director um, mm-hmm. for Charlie Chaplin and Mabel Normand and a bunch of other like silent film uh famous on film people um so a couple couple more like there we're establishing now i think some some of the people that will go on to be like big players in american movies for the next like 20 years yeah it's it's interesting a lot of the people very early on fade away pretty quickly Mm -hmm. um and it's it's only now that like people are starting to stick i think yeah um, I mean, Melies was around for the pretty much the entire history up until now, but he's about to go away. You know, I was just like, W.K.L. Dixon. Remember how we used to talk about him? Yeah. He's gone, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's not a George, factor George anymore. George Albert Smith isn't really, he's doing like some cool color photography stuff. But that's about it. Yeah, he's kind of messing around in experimentation. He's not really like making movies um, anymore. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. Um, I think Elise Guy is on sort of a, a sabbatical a bit. Yeah, uh, she she's moved, she got married. She moved to America. I think she's kind of uh, laying low a little bit, but she's got some more stuff coming down. Going yeah. Pipe, so, um, um, speaking of people that worked with Elise Key, oh, uh, Louis Fouillade. Uh, we. Oui. Uh, if you're done with, uh, yeah, with I think so. DW, um, he did a couple movies this year. He was dipping into drama a bit more, um, mm. uh. With this movie, um, Custody of the Child, which I, I guess I don't actually have too much to say about. It does seem like it has an actor credit at the beginning of it, which again is Ooh. happening here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is uh, it reminds me of those um, Capolani movies that we watched a couple of years ago. Because uh, it's, it's like this divorce. That we watched a couple of years ago. It's funny that, I mean, it makes sense, but it's yeah. funny when I hear it yeah. said out loud. It's like a divorce uh, custody drama, yeah. Where one, where Audiences one of the love parents, those. yeah. Where well, uh, I guess uh, they did back then. I mean, maybe. Although I was I was looking at this and and I saw something saying that like the fact that a movie is being made about divorce is kind of a, a wild thing for this yeah. time. I mean, both of the movies that have tackled divorce so far have been French, and they were saying that like divorce wouldn't really be shown or talked about in American movies until the 60s. Damn. Um, that's that's insanity. <laughs> I mean, I mean it checks a out. Flushing I toilet think. didn't appear in American movies until the 60s, so. Mm-hmm. No. Um and yeah, I thought the acting was really good in Custody of the Child. Uh it was a kind of operatic gesture acting, but it mm-hmm. didn't feel hammy. I thought it 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 sold the the sour feelings and 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 pain. Yeah. Um. There, and yeah, that's... there was a really funny to me. I found very funny. One of the intro titles is when when the 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 child the the boy is it a boy? The, I'm gonna yes. call him the child. Yeah, yeah. He's got like the, a a girlish yeah turn of the century sort of, boy's he, like he's haircut sort of an androgynous child. Yeah. Um, goes to live with the dad. There's an intro intertitle that says, "In spite of his privileges, the child grew, grew bored." <laughs> and I was like, "That that is just that's me right now." <laughs> I'm like, I'm very comfortable. I I'm very lucky to be where I am right now, but it's still very boring a lot of the time. <laughs> um. Oh, poor Glenn. I mean, I I really I cannot complain. Like I'm, I'm uh. I'm in a, a very cozy position. Um, the Yeah, I mean, the acting in this, I think the acting in general, I think is getting a little bit, it's not getting any necessarily, I don't know, I hesitate to, to say it's better. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think it's more, it's kind of easier to even um, judge though, because I feel like we're, we're starting to see a lot more, the cameras are getting a little bit closer to the actors. Yeah, that really helps. It's not like a whole room anymore. Now it's sort of like half a room. Now it's like, it's more sort of like waist up shots or, you know, we're getting a more of a variety of close ups and wide shots and stuff being played out in medium shots as opposed to just like very extreme wides. It's so, it's so much better. Um, I, it, it Having, having, having stuff where you can actually see people's faces is so essential. Yeah. yeah. Makes and, a big difference. turns out. Yeah. I think a lot of this stuff that we've been watching that was kind of boring in the last couple of years was really just because we couldn't see what was going on properly because it was all these super pulled back shots. Yeah. Um, not to, uh, loop, loop around too much, but one of the, um, uh, one of the Max Linder movies that I watched, which was from 1909, um, uh, the barometer of, of fidelity, I guess is the English translation of it. Oh, the yeah. barometer de, de la fidelity. Uh-huh. Um, directed by George Monka is genuinely very funny and makes really good use of performance. I think it makes sense to me that Max Linder, it, like, almost immediately became like a huge deal because he's, he's really funny. He's so he's good. Great, like physical comedy. Great. Um, yeah. Great acting. He's very expressive. Um, mm-hmm. He makes great use of his mustache to like accentuate his facial expressions and his eyebrows. Um, but, and yeah, there's, there's a, uh, there's a great substitution splice where he, he, uh, he looks at something and his and then there's a cut and his hair sticks up. Yeah. Yeah, so um, good. And yeah, but I I think I think his stuff is a really good example of the uh, sort of like I do think his performances are much better than most that we've seen, but it it helps a lot that you can actually see what he's doing. Yeah. Um, these are like some of these are chest up shots which yeah. are not common. Um and it's cutting it's it's punching in and pulling out in a lot of these uh scenes and it's it's coming in close so that you can see his expressions better which like yeah. finally you yeah. know <laughs> it's like it seems so obvious to us now um but uh you know it t- took them a little while to figure that out um uh a couple other just like some little things that i think are worth mentioning and then we can end on maybe my favorite film of the whole year oh okay all right. Well, let me jump back to Fouillade for one second, because there was this movie that he did called The Spring, mm-hmm. which... Well, the, uh, the Spring I, episode one. Yeah, I think it might have been part of like a series or yeah. something like that. I technically, I don't know, it wasn't anything too special, but I really, really liked it. I think that um, it it it's this kind of like tone... I mean, it's. I would call it the first tone poem, you uh, know, because like it, it basically it is um, today, it's, all of it, this it's stuff. A, it's that's, a vibey movie. Yeah, it's it's all of this stuff that's representing the coming of spring and all of these different um, kind of deities and and whatever um, uh, coming out of the woodwork and and doing little ballet dances. But it's like really beautiful, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. it's got a lot of these. Uh, uh, elliptical um uh mats around uh around the action which I think, has I been think every shot is uh yeah everyone or almost in, in, everyone. in oval frame yeah either which, a vertical which, or horizontal oval frame yeah which is you know we haven't seen that really we we've seen it like for a literal purpose of mm-hmm. of, of a point of view through a telescope or something like yeah. that uh grandma's reading glass too um but yeah, this is being used as a circular frame around yeah. around the images, and it makes it 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 gives it this like very kind of distinguished air. I think. Yeah, yeah, um, it, it makes it almost. It feels like you're you're like walking through a an art gallery almost. Yeah, I love um, it. I think um, the music on the Kino uh, uh, 
uh, copy of it is really nice and it complements mm-hmm. the complements it very well um and there there is a one kind of fun part where you're seeing uh some fairies who are dancing on a lake and it's it's a simple double exposure but because it's being done like for, with like nature in the background outside it's basically like these kind of ghostly fairies who are ballet dancing but it's made to look like they're walking on top of the water and i think it's just very beautiful i liked it a lot yeah yeah me too Mm -hmm. um another uh movie with fairies is the smoke fairy or princess nicotine (laughs) oh yeah uh directed by jay stewart blackton who he's been he's been going for a while yeah yeah he has Um, and um he's some which don't they don't survive but uh mm. he made some like historical epics including one that was like 50 minutes long this Ugh. year dang it I yeah see that um this it isn't the first time we've seen it but it's always fun to see uh oversized sets to see actors make actors look like they're really small yeah so we see like a giant desk with uh like cigars and and tobacco and things and i don't even know how to describe this plot it's just like a guy sits down to smoke some stuff and uh some N- fairies come out tobacco <laughs> well they say tobacco oh i see <laughs> i don't right the name of the movie is the smoke fairy it isn't the tobacco fairy so uh it's called princess nicotine yeah i guess i don't know I, I get the se- I don't I definitely read it that way. Um I don't think really think that was the intent. Right. Um cuz it's like the guy sits down t- to have a smoke and then he starts seeing fairies like messing with his stuff. Yeah. It's Just like popping mm, inside of his pipe really, and whatnot. Yeah. Um it's, it's got funny. some some fun stop motion. Um it's just a bunch yeah. of silliness, but but well done. It Yeah, and it um it it sells it sells the scale effects really well uh, without using um, without using a f- like superimposition so much. It's it's um, it's using cuts mm-hmm. and uh, to, like to kind of cut back and forth between tiny and big, uh, but because it's having big things interacting uh, on the side of the frame of the tiny things. Uh, like like smoke, he blows smoke onto the fairies, yeah. and then you see a bunch of smoke. It ties the two scenes together really well, I think. Yeah, they use little things like that to make sure that it doesn't feel like you're just cutting to a different room entirely. It's yeah. like um, they tie the two together very well. It's true. Um, one that I didn't really watch all of because it was really bad quality online is uh, Nero or the Fall of Rome. Yeah, I watched all of it. It's whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 another like historical epic from Italy. That seems to me like the only thing that Italy is really making, or the only thing that is readily accessible now, anyway. Hmm. This is their first like swords and sandals that they've ever done, apparently. Oh, okay. Um. I thought they'd done one before this, but I could be wrong. Hmm. I don't know. This is the, this is. This is what Wikipedia said. <laughs> uh, Wikipedia is often often wrong, but yeah, I suppose that's true. Um, um yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it's oh yeah, go on. I was gonna say the the highest quality you can find this online is like two forty p. It's super blurry, and I think yeah. I also think the uh, it's almost like the timing of it is off. Like it's being projected at like a weird rate maybe the timing um, of it seems very funky and messed up um but it's it's uh it's too bad because like the the sets in it look really cool there's a bunch of lavish production and costumes and things that you can barely see because it's super blurry yeah <laughs> um i'm sure if i could see this movie in hd i'd be like amazing but because it's so bad quality i'm just like i can't i can't be bothered yeah, I, I it's hate also, to be that guy, but no, I think that's reasonable. I, I, uh, the thing is that it's it's also nearly twenty minutes long, and it is, uh, f- 
the the action is so it plays out so slow mm-hmm. um so i think it's maybe a couple years old in its in its sort of we're going to put a bunch of things on in the mm. frame and we're going to pretend we're yeah. doing things but you have no context for what we're doing yeah um so it's yeah. it's very operatic in that sense that it is like you kind of need to know the story beforehand yes it's it's great to look at the like the like sensual experience of it is very rich. Yeah. But as, uh, as a way to experience a narrative, it's maybe a little bit not as robust as, as some of these other things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the, one of the nice tone things about it is that uh, there is a black and white version, but I watched the tinted version and the tinted one is green in all the scenes until uh, Rome is burnt. And then mm. it's, orange and red for the rest of the movie yeah i watched i watched the black and white one um another emil cole animation or animation live action hybrid in this case which i guess all of his have been technically yeah this one the happy microbes yeah uh (laughs) expanding on his uh his like weird stream of consciousness animation stuff yeah yeah (laughs) um yeah this one's pretty slight but it's like some fun caricatures um yeah there's like a guy yeah go on i i mean sorry to interrupt you i was i guess impressed or surprised by how one how like expressive the like characters the animated characters in it are the like yeah um, it's good cartooning the, the caricature people yeah um, and the other thing is like how, just how like abstract it is. And I don't know. I feel like that level of, of abstraction with animation, maybe it's because I am just, I was a sheltered child and all the animation I watched growing up was like Land Before Time and Toy Story. And then like, it took me a while to be like, oh yeah, animation can be like wild and wacky and very much huh. less literal than this. But like, this is some of the first like 2D animation that's being done like this and i'm surprised by how like he's not content with just like oh, yeah, i am gonna make like a guy walk into a thing and like he's like no no, no. everything is shapes like <laughs> right anything can be anything um <laughs> and i i i was surprised and uh i mean delightfully surprised by that i think yeah yeah i mean the it, it's funny that, like, we were making note of Phantasmagory for being rare in that it's animation that just, that is in its own world, and it's not, doesn't have this framing device, whereas this and uh, the other, I think most or all of the other Emil Cole movies from this year were framing devices around animation being used as, like, a little cutaway mm-hmm. thing. And so the framing of this, it, <laughs> there's this guy that's like... I'm a happy guy. And then another guy says, you shouldn't be. You're covered in microbes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always what I say when someone expresses their happiness. Oh, that's so funny. Um, so he takes like a swab of this guy and then uh, puts it in front of a microscope. And it's just cut to all of the different microbes on his skin. And they're all, they all kind of are these little dots that start swimming and then they coalesce into shapes of little caricature people there is the pestilent microbe that of the politician the lazy (laughs) microbe that of the civil servant the raging microbe that of the (laughs) mother-in-law the first mother-in-law jokes um real real hard-hitting uh social commentary there yeah cool and yeah there's a couple other ones uh the mother-in-law is the one with the big claws right yeah, the mother-in-law, they really sink into that one. It's got, yeah. like, a demonic mother-in-law. That one is arguably the worst one. We're really... Emil Cole did not like his mother-in-law, clearly. Yeah. I wonder if people, like, do pe- people who make mother-in-law jokes all the time, like, are they just really out there, like, putting putting themselves in the danger zone that way? Just putting, airing all their dirty laundry, you know? <laughs> um... But the the final one is the drunkard's microbe, and it has a, a a really nice integration of a physical bottle with the two um, mm. D animation, which is pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, 
And then, uh, I guess to to go out on, we can talk about. I think not the best movie from this year, but my uh-huh. personal favorite movie from this year. Wow, the, Air, the Airship Destroyer, <laughs> which is is incomplete. It's, it's not the whole thing as it did. Oh, is it incomplete? Existed. Okay. Um, it's directed by Walter R. Booth, who has done a bunch of other like fun, kind of wacky, fantastical movies. Yep. Um, he did Legend or the not Legend of the Sword. The t- the what am I thinking? The of Magic I, Sword. The Magic Sword. Legend yeah. of the Sword is the Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie. Um, <laughs> this is the second time you've done. That. I know. I'm gonna keep every time I misstate the title. I'm gonna do that. Um, as far as I can tell, this might be like the first sci-fi action movie or like sci-fi war movie. Yeah. I yeah. I was. It's pretty wild how warlike it was. It's, I, I, it's about a, an inventor, a, a lovelorn inventor, who's trying to like get married, but uh, the the woman's dad doesn't like him or something. I'm a little bit unsure about that part. There's probably more to it than that, but the film was lost. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's got an invention of this sort of like flying torpedo thing, and then. Uh, Outside, there is sort of concurrently with that, there is a an invasion happening of airships over England um, that are dropping bombs and blowing up armored cars and causing mischief and mayhem. And there's a there's a dog fighting scene with like an airplane fighting the Zeppelin. Yeah, that is super cool, and yeah, it's yeah. really great use of like force perspective. Um, and then the, the love Lord inventor has to use his flying rocket thing to shoot down the Zeppelins, um, and save the day. Uh, it, it if, you, feels... if you know me at all, you know, this is the, you know why this is my favorite <laughs> of the year. It's, it's a you very only rated it three and a half stars. Well, three, this is like, I don't like it as much as like, I don't know. What's the movie that came out this year that I liked that I gave Jupiter. Stars. Voyage to Jupiter. Did I get that four stars? Oh, I don't um, know what you gave four stars. I yeah. have other movies I've given four stars to. I'm like, I don't like it as much as that, but I like it a lot. Okay. Um, it's a little messy, but it's like it captures like the chaos of a war movie. Yeah. It feels like a bit of a premonition of World War One. Yeah. With this and, like and two. I mean, it's it's yeah. definitely prophetic in foretelling like the use of airships in World War One to bomb things and like yeah, yeah. airplanes. D- to dogfight them like those things hadn't happened when this movie was made right um yeah there's then, the scene of like a tank driving a tank it looks like a really dinky car but well, it's I, dressed up to look like a I, tank. I assume it, it's it's an armored car which it, i think it existed i know it existed pre-world war one I. I assume they existed at this point okay um, um but yeah like it's it's being attacked by bombs being kicked off of a dirigible and yeah. exploding all around it on the ground it's very actiony <laughs> yeah there's tons of explosions left and right there's so many explosions in this movie it's great um the first perspective thing is really really cool there's a shot of a model zeppelin airship dirigible yeah and you see a little model airplane sort of like fly plat fly past it mm-hmm. and then a full-size airplane with actors in it pass the opposite direction in front of the camera yeah, yeah, yeah. That As if it's good. sort of gotten closer to the camera, and then once it passes, we see the model again coming back at coming back around. Oh, I didn't realize those were supposed to be the same thing. I thought it was just giving depth to the scene of like another plane flying by, or I definitely or assumed like that. it was supposed to be the same plane, like looping, okay. looping around, which is nice, great. Um, and yeah, there's all these. There's there's a, a great shot of looking up in through binoculars at like uh, a cloud of of airships like coming through the sky yeah yeah um that's uh great i love just the the uh this movie's got airships and airplanes and stuff blown up i love it. <laughs> yeah the the one on youtube is silent and so i looked up uh steampunk music generic <laughs> steampunk music to put on this one i think i think the one that I watched had a soundtrack, but I turned it off and played something else. I do not remember what it was. 
Um, but yeah, that one was was very fun. Um, <sighs> I know what what was your favorite film from this year? My favorite film was uh, Voice of Jupiter. Yeah, I like. That. I mean that. I I really really like that movie. That would be my other choice, and I yeah. I had some difficulty with kind of choosing if I was going to choose between the two, but I figured I figured you might choose jupiter so i i went with airship destroyer also because it was it's very on brand for me it is very on brand for you i i kind of i mean spring's a close runner-up i i really just kind of got swept away by that one um but yeah uh, a voyage to jupiter is amazing yeah Um, yeah really really cool well all right we got our Uh, favorites we we finished out our first full decade of of film history yeah i suppose so I've been thinking that we should like kind of start thinking about some like big takeaways from this early era of film. Ooh, um, but I'm uh, I'm surprised at how early a lot of things are showing up. Yeah, like color and sound. I did not know were like kind right. of kind of there from the get go. Yeah. Um. um yeah, I, I've definitely learned a lot uh, for sure. But it, it's funny how color was kind of ubiquitous in the beginning um and it must have fallen way out uh once the films became more um i don't know production line kind of i think thing. i think yeah it probably was just so labor intensive and the fact that they needed to pump things out much quicker and get them distributed to much a much wider audience it probably was just cost prohibitive to right to do that for every for even a couple movies i don't know Hmm. Um, I I didn't have any takeaways. I just uh, I <laughs> I, mean, I didn't my, think of it yet. My biggest takeaway, I guess, is that I am I am like impressed with watching. Yeah. This. I'm like, oh, these are really good. Not that I doubted that because what I had seen was good. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that um, you know, at times I've been a little frustrated at how slowly the film language has developed, but it's also mm-hmm. been really interesting to watch that happen. Uh, yeah. In fit, I think the film language stuff has been in a lot more fits and starts. Mm-hmm. Um, but the stuff that I love is the effects um, and the imaginative visuals. I'm imagining taking a lot of these like sci-fi films, uh, including um, the the airship one, and just like if you like, it would be great to have them put on the background in like a bar or something like that. You know. Yeah. Uh, just to to have um, Legend of a Ghost uh, mm-hmm. just be playing, you know, on a screen somewhere. It'd just be awesome, you know? And yeah. the, this, the coolness of the way these movies look really holds up. Yeah, definitely. I think I think a lot of the kind of, um, almost like the analog nature of them too, the, the like handcraftedness of them yeah. gives them a lot of, it increases that coolness quality and that it's not like, you know, in in um, Legend of a Ghost, like driving around with a big car like full of skeletons is just like this is great. <laughs> um, I'm I'm starting to think that Legend of a Ghost might be my favorite movie that we've seen so far. <laughs> I mean, I, I, Trip to the Moon is still I know it's like the it's really answer. really good. Trip to the Moon yeah. really is very very good. Like it deserves yeah. the credit that it has. Um, Legend of a Ghost absolutely deserves way more credit than it has and then it's it, like 600 views on yeah, youtube legend of a ghost needs a full hd theatrical re-release i'm please yeah it's so good <laughs> <sighs> well with that i guess we're saying goodbye to the 19 aughts yeah and on to 1910 Ooh. next year yeah uh well big, big if decade you... coming up 1910s. Indeed, yeah. I feel like looking back on the 1910s is going to be very different. I think the state of films and filmmaking is going to be very, very different by yeah, 1919. In, in, yeah, in 1919, we'll be we'll definitely be seeing more mature feature films. I we think. might be into all features by that point. I'm not sure. Yeah, or at least hopefully, <laughs> so we can start to start to focus up a bit more. Here. Yeah, that would be nice. Um. Well, if you like 
uh, this podcast. Uh, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, or uh, keep subscribing if you're listening on a podcast. And uh, follow us on the socials. Not that we do anything with those, because, I mean, <laughs> nobody actually listens to this podcast, but, you know, maybe someday. Um, one day. One day we'll use them. Yeah. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Uh, Glenn, I will see you next year. See you next year.